Hello everyone, welcome to the DH Education Podcast, your program to be updated on the digital heritage education domain. I'm your host, Raul Gomez Hernandez, and I'm glad to be here with you. In the 12th episode of this podcast, we will speak with Sarah Jones about the relevance of learning outcomes assessment in heritage education, differences and similarities between formal and non-formal education learning outcomes, the ways of co-working between teachers and museum educators, the aim and the relevance of the generic learning outcomes model, and the recommendation to implement in the museum this model to get the most effective heritage educational materials for young people. Stay to the end and discover some innovative projects and book recommendations to explore more around this topic. In formal education, learning outcomes are defined as a statement of the knowledge, skills and abilities students possess can demonstrate upon completion of a learning experience or sequence of learning experiences. These learning outcomes are created and assessed by the teacher and also their progress can be judged by others, and the aim is to acquire some external standard of knowledge. By comparison, the learning outcomes in informal education are understood as a result of learning but in an individual way, but not depending on a strict assessment. They are a table, no one can judge each other, because the learning process depends on the participant and everyone can establish their limits, and the aim is to get new knowledge but moving at their own pace. Both definitions of learning outcomes have a positive impact on the meaning-making process of learning and the capacity of understanding the reality, but both need to be reconfigured. After this introduction to the learning outcomes, let me propose some questions to discuss today with our speaker. How can learning outcomes be written effectively for heritage educational purposes? How relevant is to make an assessment of the learning outcomes from the educational program? So, this week, I would like to talk with Sarah Jones about it. Hello, Sari. Thank you very much for coming to this podcast. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Let me introduce yourself a bit to the audience. Sari Jones is a researcher with an interest in the role that museums and cultural organizations have to play within society and the opportunities for engagement and learning they provide for individuals and communities. From 2002 to 2018, she joined the Research Center for Museums and Galleries RSMG, based in the School of Museum Studies at the University of Leicester, as a research assistant to support the piloting of the generic learning outcomes as part of the MLA Aspiring Learning for All initiative, where she undertook research in several topics, like the social role of museums or the museum learning outcomes. During this time, Sari completed her PhD in Museum Studies and she was presenting RCMG research at conferences such as National Army Museum, the Visitor Studies Association Annual Conference in the USA, Hacking Museum and the National Gallery. Also, from 2009-2018, she has been book review editor from the independent peer review online journal Museum and Society. At the present, Sari works as a freelance researcher for a number of different projects related to museums and education. In the process of development of heritage education projects, four dimensions are included, communicative dimension, social dimension, pedagogical dimension, and emotional dimension of the educational materials. In the pedagogical one, the type of teaching method is important, but it is even more important to focus on the aims and the learning outcomes of the activities and materials. To understand better the significance of learning outcomes in the heritage education domain, could you briefly explain what the learning outcomes are? why they are important, and why it's important to make an assessment of these learning outcomes in the heritage education domain. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll go back a bit to why um, the learning outcomes are necessary, really, especially in the UK. Um, There was a a project written, um, a report about the educational value of museums in the early 1990s, um, which kind of looked at why museums um, were educational or places of learning and what we could do to kind of make that more obvious to a wider audience. Um, So I think one thing about museums and cultural heritage sites, that sort of thing, is that they're often presumed to be good for learning, but it's often either not captured or it's not really well understood. So the idea was to try and demonstrate more specifically why museums and cultural sites were good for the public, good for society, and especially in their terms of learning, as a learning, a place of learning, really. Um, So museums have always assumed to be a place of learning, 
probably from the very early days when they were founded. You know, the idea of putting objects together in a particular way could show some insight into human culture or human society um, and what visitors to that place could get from it. But as, as I say, there wasn't really any sense of what that looked like or why it was important. So there was a real move to demonstrate why, that, why museums are important, but also what that learning would look like. And that's where the idea of learning outcomes come in. So what, as a visitor to a museum, do you get from that experience of being in the museum? Um, so, for example, you know, what do people find out when they go? What do they, what new knowledge do they get? Um, does, do they change their mind about something? Does it encourage them to do something different or, you know, read a, a book about a subject or something? So it was really about capturing that. But because um, people who go to museums, you know, they're not part of a, a course or like going to school, they're not they don't need to learn anything, you know, it's not, um, what's the word, it's not mandatory that you do learn something. So it couldn't be museums setting um, ideas about what they wanted their visitors to learn. It had to come from the visitors themselves. So that's why it focused on the idea of this outcome. What does the visitor get from taking part in this experience? That's really interesting what you say about the educational role of museums. The perspective of a museum as a place of learning was something introduced by the new museology in the late 80s and over all the 90s from the last century. And from this time, the pedagogical dimension of the museum has been developed in educational programs and studies. Also, the educational role is connected with engagement, and many engagement initiatives are nowadays connected with the educational purpose of the museum no matter if they are in a physical way or digital. And that's a great opportunity for education in the present. I was just going to agree, yeah. <laughs> it's not always clear. And I guess with digital learning as well, it's even less clear for museums what people are getting from it because, again, you've got that further remove um, from the visitor themselves. I mean, when the visitor comes to a museum, you're kind of, you've got them there you can kind of see and observe them. But again, with the digital aspect, you're taking that physical um, engagement away from the museum themselves and they can't, it's less controllable. But I think that's the issue, you know, with learning outcomes, you can't control what the visitor's learning. It's just capturing what's happening. I think making an assessment of the learning outcomes of every activity, how the museums do you know how people engage with their content too. But it's a pity that many museums are not so transparent, including the educational and engagement stages with the learning outcomes of the website. In the same way, many surveys reported in the last few years, including the Digital Heritage Education Project survey, that teachers and museum educators need to work more together. Some museums have created some educational projects with the schools in the regions. Some of them have created together some educational resources, but that's not the rule. Taking the situation, could you explain with her, from your point of view, the differences and similarities between formal and non-formal learning outcomes? And how can teachers and museums work together for developing more effective and similar learning outcomes for creating more progress in the future? Okay, um, so I would define formal learning outcomes um, as those which are defined or desired by the teacher or the mentor of the student. So the person who's setting the um, course or whatever the um, students are involved with. Um, so an informal learning outcome in contrast are those which are articulated by or can be captured from the learner. So these are not set outcomes. They're not, um, they're not required. They're just how that learner responds to the material or the experience that they've been given. So, um, and as I say, they are articulate, articulated by learners. Sometimes I don't think learners can articulate, can always articulate their own experiences. So it might have to be captured in a different way. For example, um, a drawing or a piece of writing that someone does about it. But um, that's the fundamental difference for me. A formal outcome is set by someone else for a learner to learn and an informal outcome is something that is important to the learner themselves. Um, 
So, and I think with museums, there is always this, and other cultural organisations, there's always a sense that the outcomes there can be defined. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't have so many museum education programmes um, and learning programmes that are established by museums with specific outcomes and things that they want to see. Um, but I also think that for a lot of people going into museums, the informal ones are just as important. What the people get outside of those set outcomes um, are also critical to understand what they've got from their experience. Um, and I think what's interesting is um, when I was working with uh, Leicester University, we did a lot of um, sessions with schools and with teachers and museums. And some of the things I think about how museums and schools can work better together, I think it's mostly about communication. Um, I think a lot of the time there was a either a lack of communication or a miscommunication between what museums wanted and what teachers wanted. And obviously um, both museum and teachers, museum workers and teachers are very busy people. Um, they often had to find time to communicate, but when they did find that time, it was really, uh, really useful because that's when they were clear about what they wanted from each other and they could develop the sessions um, to meet both of those needs and also the needs of the learners because we don't want to forget about them as well. Um, so for example, museums that were successful in developing good education programmes often had focus groups with teachers where they would invite them to talk about what they wanted to get from museums and for their students. Um, museums that used uh, evaluation, so using surveys um, or interviews with teachers to find out how their experiences had gone and what they could do better. Um, and I think it's also about broadening both teachers and museum workers at perspectives on what teachers can get from museums, but also what museums can offer to teachers as well. I think sometimes there's a bit of, as with most institutions, there's particular ways of thinking that are ingrained in those institutions. And I think a lot of the successful programmes are about getting outside those narrow ways of thinking and trying to do different things. And also one thing that I also found was often neglected are including parents in these discussions as well. I mean, um, a lot of parents have very specific ideas about what museums are and what they can offer. I think often if teachers and parents and museums could get together, that might be an interesting way of coming up with new ideas as well. Um, sorry, I'm probably rambling a bit now, but um, I'm just thinking of, what other successful things museums brought. I think it's where museums as well are willing to change and take risks to sort of think outside what they're doing already and, you know, trying new things with schools. But again, it, it all depends on the teachers as well. Are they prepared to try new things and take risks? Because, you know, they've got to show that the, the visits they're doing have value to their students and to the curriculum often, which can be quite uh, confining sometimes because curriculums are often very specific. Whereas I think museum visits are much more um, broader in terms of the experience and the value that they can bring to students. We once did this, this large project with schools where we got children to write down or draw what their favorite thing about the museum was. And uh, one um, picture we always loved was this beautifully detailed drawing of the bus taking the children on the school trip and that child had their favorite thing about the museum was going on the bus trip because clearly they obviously didn't get out on many trips so it was the actual going out that was important to them um, and in a way you might look at that and think oh that's you know they're not even thinking about the museum itself but see so that broadness of that experience is also something that I think needs to be valued by teachers as well as by museums as well um, and another thing that I think is important is thinking about you know students with different needs and abilities as well you know what can they get out of a museum experience um, looking again looking beyond 
what we see as formal learning, the need to know things and, you know, in terms of attitudes and values and um, also seeing museums as a place that they can go that is um, accessible to them and somewhere that, you know, welcomes them and makes them, you know, feel that their, their experience is valued as much as everyone else's. So I think, again, the key thing is communication. You know, museums need to be able to communicate what they can give to teachers and teachers need to communicate with museums what they want from them, but also both sides being open to new experiences. I agree with you. The key word is communication. I think it's not only that museums don't ask teacher what they think about their activities, but also overall, the issue comes from the museum that prepare educational resources and materials, and they don't include teachers in the development process, as you say exactly what happened with families. Also, many museums, as I said before, don't include their learning outcomes in the educational program, and without communication and training on hard education for the teacher, it is difficult to generate interest in teachers for working with museums. That's true, and again, I mean, I put, I mean, I just made some notes and at the moment, I put money and time is always an issue as well, isn't it? It's, you know, museums having the time to reach out to teachers, teachers having the time to respond and, you know, and having the money to do this because, I mean, I don't know the situation in Europe as well as I do in the UK, but I know that a lot of funding for education programmes in the UK has, has dipped quite substantially um, in the past few years with um, particular policies and government which were focused more on austerity and, you know, not valuing the arts as much um, as a social good than, you know, they might otherwise have been. And that, of course, also affects, you know, the amount of of time and effort that museums put into their learning and education projects because I mean and this is going to a, ma a bigger issue in itself you know how does the museum and cultural heritage sector value learning and education is it core to their mission as an organization or is it you know a, a side or an add-on um, aspect of what they do which where the main thing is always the collecting and the preservation of the objects um, I mean, this is a bigger issue in itself, generally, um, and it, again, it depends on the different organisations. Yeah, we know that some of the most important treats are the lack of time and the lack of money to face the priorities and tasks that museum must do, but for making participatory processes to work together with all stakeholders in development of content, they only need good management and including it as a priority in stages. It doesn't take more time or more money than what is supposed to be done before. What needs to change is the method of working, opening museums to the citizens in many ways, and breaking out the perspective you mentioned before, from the 19th century as a place only for collecting items, more than dissemination and education. A good example where both processes are used is the local museums, as you know from the UK, where they are very involved with the citizens collecting local stories and items. As you say, it goes to fundamental questions, doesn't it, about who are museums for, what is their purpose? And these are questions that are still being argued, over. well, they always will be argued over, but um, and if the museum is clear about who it's for, what it wants to do and how it's going to achieve that, I think a lot of the learning stuff flows um, logically from that. It, so if your museum is elitist and you know wants a specific type of education result, then that's what you get. <laughs> and um, if you're, as you say, if you're a local museum which tends to be closer to their community and more participatory, not all of them, but a lot of them are, um, then you get you do get those more interesting projects where they're they're more like um, yeah, collaborative where people work, you know, the museum works with the schools to develop the education project. And I mean, going back to something you said earlier about involving students as well, I mean, I think that's a really interesting issue as well. You know, um, how many museums reach out to students and, you know, children and young people and find out what they want to see um, in a museum experience. So, you know, there's lots of questions to be